Okay, so we're going to start today talking about Android activities. We're not going to go into a huge amount of detail there because it really doesn't apply as much anymore. Uh, when you're using Jetpack Compose, a lot of the work that the activities were doing is actually being handled by Compose. So let's take a little bit of a look inside of here. The idea behind an activity is this is one of Android's four application components. You have activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. The big one that people usually use is going to be activities. Uh, the other ones you may use here and there, uh, but just not as much. Uh, each activity represents a screen inside your application. And you have a choice of either going with multiple activities in your applications. You could actually switch between different screens that an activity represents, or you could just swap out the content inside of the activity. And that's kind of the, the general uh, best practice right now is to swap the content out. There are several ways to do that. One of the more common ways in the past was using fragments. A fragment represents part of a user interface, or it could re represent you know, a page inside your application. The, uh, the, the more common way now is to use Jetpack Compose, or at least the planned way to now is to use Jetpack Compose. So you'll be drawing things on the screen is really what Compose is doing. Uh, you may have multiple activities still, so you might decide, okay, I'm going to have one activity for my settings page instead of implementing my settings using Compose or something else. But for this class, we're just going to stick with the single activity scenario. Each activity has a life cycle associated with it, and this is pretty common across all of the application components in Android. <clears throat> the idea is that you don't actually create an instance of it and then say go. It's not like a main inside an application. You declare which activities you have inside your application, and then Android creates the activity for you and then calls several uh, callback functions for you. So you'll define some callbacks to say, what do I want to do when I want to create my user interface? What do I want to do when I'm pausing this to switch to a different activity? Or maybe the user is going back to the home screen. There are different interactions you can do based on those callback functions. But you're not the one driving. The Android system is the one driving. The basic life cycle, and these are the kind of the core functions in there. There's a few others, but the core functions here move you in and out of states. So you have three states inside your application. There's one state called stopped or created. There's another one called paused or visible, and another one that's called resumed or foregrounded. And depending on what state you're in, that defines how the user can interact with you. So if you're in the resumed state, then the user can actually interact because that activity is in the foreground. It's what they're interacting with. If you're in a paused but visible state, this means that maybe something else is in front of it. There might be a dialogue up in front of the activity. There might be maybe a phone screen is popping up, depending on the device you're on. Uh, but in that case, the user can't interact with it, but they can still see some parts, possibly. If you're stopped or in the stopped created, they won't see the user interface, but the activity is still there, ready to go. Now, once you move out past that stopped created state, your activity is destroyed or it hasn't been created yet. In between state transitions is where it calls these different callback functions. So at the point where the activity is being created, the actual instance is created first, and then we call on create. And the on create function is going to be a, a call to let you set up your user interface. And I tried to kind of group here the types of things that you're going to want to do with each of the at each of these uh, callback functions. So for example, when on create, you're going to be creating your views, maybe fetching a little data to help uh, set up those views, um, set up some listeners on the views so that when the user interacts, you can respond, um, possibly restoring some saved state from somewhere. You know, maybe it's on a disk, maybe it's in a database, whatever. Um, when you're moving between the stopped and the pause state, that's where on start is called. And the on start function is going to uh, be a good place to refresh any type of displayed values on the screen or bind some services. So if behind the scenes you're going to be listening to location service, for example, then you might want to uh, bind at this point. So anytime you start and stop, you would disconnect from the location service and wouldn't have all these events coming from GPS, for example. Between paused and visible, on resume is called, and this is really your chance to do something just before the application becomes interactive. 
So maybe you want to start some animations. Maybe you want to play some sounds or music. Uh, and maybe you want to actually hook up some listeners to services to actually interact with them. On the flip side, on the way out of this, you're going to be performing some functions. So when the, the application is no longer going to be interactive, on pause is called. So this is a great place to save data if you have data that you haven't saved yet. Hopefully, when you're designing your application, you'll be saving the data on the fly. But if there's any other data you need to save, usually it's a good idea to do it on pause, just to make sure everything's saved before you're starting to get out of the application. Um, in here, if you had some animations going, you might want to stop them. You might want to stop your sounds and services and disconnect your service uh, listeners. When the activity is going to be made not visible, that's when on stop is called. So there, you want to unbind any services that you might have bound up front here. Finally, for on destroy, this is your last chance to do anything before the activity is completely thrown away. You might have some files to close up at this point. Generally, there's not a whole lot to do inside this, but sometimes you're going to have a use for, hey, I know this thing is really going away for sure and is never going to come back. Maybe I need to, to do some cleanup. So some kind of examples on things you might want to do. Um, if you have a thread that updates the user interface or does some animation on there, um, you can do that in start stop. Uh, you can start and stop the thread to do that. Um, or maybe connect, disconnect a service to get your current location. Um, very often, the types of things you're going to do to start that, stop that thread are going to happen in on start or on resume. It just kind of depends on if you care about that being active when the user can't interact with the screen or not. If the user has to be able to interact with the screen, then you're going to want to do it in on resume. If not, you'll do it in on start. Um, and then you'll end the corresponding action inside on stop and on pause. So if you want to try to pair them up, if you did it non, if you started it non start, you want to end it non stop. If you started it on resume, you want to end it on pause. Now you must do start and stop everywhere that you're using some kind of thread or every, or um, or doing some kind of a service. Uh, make sure you pair those up. And there's some nice ways to do with lifecycle observers. Um, that's something that I may or may not cover in the class. Uh, it's depending on what we're doing, there might be a call for it. Uh, but one thing that's nice is you can kind of bundle up the start and the stop into a single object. So you're encapsulating that functionality and you'll make sure that it's started in the right place and stopped in the right place always. Need to talk a little bit about process death. One of the challenges is that Android can kill your application at any time even when it's running. I mean, it, it's very, very rare that that happens, but uh, most of the time what's going to end up happening is that the, the, user will, um, uh, uh, the user will back out of the application and it won't be used for a little while and Android will say, hey, I need a little bit of memory. Let me just go ahead and close things out. So the activity still could be kept around for a little while, uh, but the, uh, the system might not be displaying it. Um, that's useful, for example, if the user hits the home button, they go back to the home screen, and then maybe they want to jump back into the application. Uh, Android may keep things around a little bit in the, in the intermediate there. Um, but Android does like to kill things. Now, when things get killed, you're going to get a call to at least on pause and most likely on stop. And the on stop depends on which version you're targeting with, uh, or which version is actually being run on the device that you're, you're looking at. Um, whenever Android kills the process, before it does that, it'll call on pause, possibly on stop, and then it will actually kill the process that's hosting your application, which means that any type of data you were using, that'll all get collected. Any type of services will automatically be snipped. It'll stop threads because there's no more process running. <clears throat> Next thing we need to talk about is the concept of a configuration. Each device has a certain configuration based on the way the user has set it up. And there's a whole bunch of different things that can contribute to what's considered a configuration. Uh, some of the most common ones are language and region. Uh, and that can drive which resources are used in your application to display things like strings or to format dates. And, uh, or you know, possibly even if you wanted to, to use that to choose uh, a, a measurement system. Um, layout direction 
is super, super common. If the user rotates the phone, every time they rotate it, you're changing the configuration of the device. Your application will be notified about that and different resources will be chosen based on that. Uh, this, uh, the, the way the resources work for layouts isn't as big a deal with Jetpack Compose. You'll still be able to, to check to see, hey, am I wider than I am tall or taller than I am wide? Um, but you won't have to worry about XML files being picked for layouts. In the past, what would happen is that when you rotated the device, if you had different layouts in layout-land versus layout-portrait, it would choose the appropriate layout based on the current device configuration. And so you could actually have different definitions of the layout. Jetpack Compose actually makes that a lot easier because it's just code that's defining what's on the screen. Um, if the screen size changes, and it may seem weird to think about the screen size changing, but think about things like uh, if the user split screens, because it's actually possible on Android devices to split screen and have two applications visible at once. You can't do it for every application, but a lot of applications you can do that. And when that happens, the size of your application is, is being changed. It treats it as though it's a screen size. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of other things here you can see that uh, can change the configuration. Android version is, is one as well, whether or not there's a physical keyboard available or maybe somebody's plugged in a keyboard. Those can all contribute to configurations. And that's important when we start looking at resources in the application. Each of the resources are stored under this res directory that we'll see when I'm going through uh, uh, the sample application. In the res directory, we have subdirectories for the different types of resources. Drawables are things that can be drawn on the screen. Layouts are, in this case, XML files that define how to structure what the user is seeing on the screen. MIP maps are images. Values are just different types of values, like colors. There'll be some values in there representing different colors. Strings will represent what the user sees on the screen. It could just be a fixed string. It could be a string that has some placeholders that you, you drop different values in. Um, themes represent uh, different ways of uh, displaying the screen as far as colors, font sizes, and um, let's see anything else in there. Those are the big things, colors and font sizes and iconography. Um, now you'll notice that each of these I have inside of here has some alternatives. So we have drawable versus drawable V24. And by default, if you don't have any dash something after these, it's just representing that collection of resources. As soon as you put this dash, it's representing those resources for a specific configuration. So in this particular example, if I have drawables, which the defaults are all in this main drawable directory, but if there's anything defined under drawable v24 and we're at least running Android version 24, it will pick any of the resources under this directory. Uh, it'll prefer the resources in this directory versus the ones in the base drawable directory. Now, layout directory would work the same, but in this case, I don't have any differences. If we take a look at all these MIP map guys inside here, we'll see that these are changing for different logical screen resolutions. Now, there's uh, several older screen resolutions they're using here. Um, the very lowest one was called LDPI for lowest uh, dots per inch. And then you had medium, high, extra high, extra, extra high, extra, extra, extra high, and so on. Um, you can actually get more explicit with this and say, if I if my screen is at least a certain width in something we call density independent pixels, I'm going to talk about in a bit, those are a little safer way to do it. So it's if I'm at least a certain size, then I can pick different size images that have a higher resolution. Um, you'd normally use this so that if you're trying to display a, an image on the screen, you use a lower resolution version of it so it doesn't have to get scaled as often. And then finally down here, we'll see values. In this case, this values-night is if we're in night mode. If we wanted to, and the most common use of the values is for uh, um, language, we could have a values-es for Spanish. And then if we had uh, some default values and values, it would use those unless the user uh, has set their device to be Spanish, in which case they'll see the ones that are under values-es. Um, so you could see that there could be a lot of different uh, resource directories inside of here, especially if you've localized it to many, many locales. I heard somebody the other day mention they localized something to like 51 different languages, uh, which is amazing. It's you know It makes it so much easier for a user to use the device if English isn't their primary language. 
assuming that you've had English be the default for your application. Um, when a configuration change happens, and the most common one is rotating the device, when a configuration change happens, it's actually going to destroy the, the activity instance and recreate it. Um, there are ways to get around this, but it's generally a good idea to avoid that. What you want to do is let the activity get destroyed and recreated, because then it can automatically pick which resources it needs. Uh, so if the user changes language, it'll destroy the activity, recreate it, loading the, the text resources from whatever the closest match language is. Um, any data you define in the activity, so any type of fields, will be lost unless you explicitly saved it or put it into something like a view model. Uh, we're going to be using a view model in here, and a view model is an in-memory object that holds data for an activity and stays alive throughout configuration changes. Makes your life a little simpler. So let's talk about screen density a little bit. I, I alluded it to it earlier. The idea here is we're going to use something called a density independent pixel. That's a DIP. That is the size physically of one pixel on a screen that's 160 dots per inch. And that's fairly old and fairly low density as far as uh, screens are concerned. But that's their base. So starting with a density independent pixel being the physical size of a pixel on 160 dots per inch. So basically it's 160th of an inch is how big a DP is. SP is a similar concept, but it scales with any selected font size because the devices are going to give you the, uh, the option of saying, I want the fonts to be bigger or smaller. That will scale here. So the base uh, font, the base SP will be used for whatever the default size is, and then you, the user can scale it higher or lower. Comparing these using the logical density, if we had like a low density, medium, high, extra high, and extra extra, this little table gives you kind of an idea of how they map together. The medium is 160 dots per inch, so on that, one DIP is exactly the size of a pixel on the screen. If we go to extra high, each of these, uh, each DIP is represent, or sorry, yeah, each DIP is representing two pixels wide by two pixels tall. Uh, and that's just how the scaling works here. If we went up to extra extra, then each DPI, each DIP is three pixels wide. Now, the reason we think about this is because it would be really nice no matter how big the screen is, no matter how dense the screen is, to have certain elements on the screen always be the same physical size. So if you think of a button that you're going to use to push your thumb on, you want that button to be about 48 DIPs. And what that means is that it's going to map to a physical size on the screen that's a good size for tapping with your thumb. When you go to higher density screens, It'll use more pixels to represent that touch area, basically making it exactly the same size on different screens. And let's take a look at an example of that. <clears throat> if I had these pictures, and this is a picture of me getting eaten by a dragon. If we have some pictures here, we could specify it in DIPs or PX. Um, if we did it in pixels, notice what happens as the screen gets more dense. For a low density screen, if I have a certain number of pixels, it's going to take up more space on the screen. As the density increases, I'm going to take up less space physically on the screen because you know I only need 200 pixels. If the screen is you know 800 pixels wide, I'm going to take up a quarter of the screen. Versus if the screen screen is actually in this case 200 pixels wide, it'll take up 200 pixels. Now you'll notice here on the medium one, if I specify it in 200 uh, density independent pixels or 200 pixels, it ends up taking exactly the same amount of space because that's the baseline. But if I specify in density independent pixels, that picture looks the same physical size on all of these screens, which is a really great way to do this. Now, DIP is most commonly abbreviated as just DP. So you're almost never going to see somebody say DIP. You're going to see .dp used inside your projects. <coughs> Okay, any questions on anything that I've covered there? So let's take a look at a quick sample project here, which I'm going to use for my database in a minute here. 
So I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to make this an empty compose activity. And I am going to call this guy uh, room example. How about that? And I'm going to change this one to be com.javadude, just for the examples in the class. That's my website, javadude.com. And I'm going to put that under my Android class directory so that I can post that up there. Um, I'm picking minimum SDK of 21, which is what I had set up for the course website. And note here that it's telling you that it's going to be uh, useful on about 98.6% uh, devices, which is really good. We might want to at some point go up to eight, uh, API 23 because it still covers just about everybody. And there's a few things that are a little simpler to do in 23, uh, but I'm going to keep with 21. This help me choose here is going to give you a little chart describing the different versions of Android. So we'll see here that 21 is called Lollipop. It covers 98.6% of the devices that have connected to the Play Store. And I believe that's over a, maybe the past year. Uh, there's a certain time frame that they use to measure this. It might be quarterly, it might be yearly. I think it might be yearly, but I'm not positive. Um, but this also gives you the option, if you click on any of these, it tells you the, the key features that were introduced inside there or key changes that were made in that uh, version. So we're going to stick with 21. And I'm going to hit Finish. And it'll take a moment for it to import the project. It shouldn't be too bad. It's going to depend a lot on the speed of your computer. Um, one of the one of the biggest impacts will be if you have a normal hard drive versus an SSD. An SSD makes this much much faster. And I'm running with an SSD, by the way. And I think I have a true jet engine inside this laptop. At least it sounds like it. Now what it's doing right now is it's looking at the Gradle files. These are the build files that describe our application and pulling that data into Android Studio so that when I'm editing, it'll see it in the same context as though it were built in the command line. That way we have dependencies. We can use uh, uh, the uh, content assist to pull up references to dependencies and so on. Normally it doesn't quite take this long. Well, at least it's changing. That's good. There we go. So I changed this to say project over here because I like to see the file-based view of things. And let's take a look at the structure in this application real quick. So we have our base directory. Underneath it, we have some top-level build files, the settings.gradle and build.gradle. We have a couple little scripts here that will run what's called the Gradle wrapper. And the Gradle wrapper is nice because it will download Gradle if you don't have it currently installed. And the version of Gradle that you want to use is defined in this Gradle wrapper.properties. So that whoever grabs your code will be building it using the same version of Gradle that you built. Um, then the app module, you notice how it's bold there and has a little icon. That's a sub module. It's basically a sub project that's get it's built. And then uh, we use that to actually execute the application. We can put in other sub-modules for libraries if we want as well. Underneath that app directory, you almost never use this lives directory, and I recommend that you just go ahead and delete it. Uh, that's there if you want to drop in a third-party jar, which I strongly recommend against. What you want to do is use Maven repositories to pull those dependencies in. Um, and so we'll see underneath this application, he has a build file as well. And then he also has some source groups. There's a source group called main, which is where all your base code goes. And then there's two test groups here, Android test and, and uh, test. Test is for unit tests. Android test is for what we call instrumented tests. These are ones that are actually going to be run on an emulator. They're much, much slower than unit tests. Uh, try to do as much as you can in unit test directory, um, unless you're really trying to test the user interface. Now underneath main, we're going to see that there's a Java directory. That's where all our code goes. Even if you're doing Kotlin, most of the time people use Java. 
You can throw Java code and Kotlin code in there together. If you prefer, you could have a Kotlin directory there as well. Uh, then there's our resource directory. This represents the resources in the file. So if we take a look in the application. We take a look, we have the drawables, we have these MIP maps, we have values in XML. XML is just raw XML that uh, can vary based on configuration if you want to read those. Values are typically files that have individual piecemeal resources inside of them. And then up here we have this entire uh, IC launcher background is considered a resource by itself. Behind the scenes, Android's going to pull these into the APK that's built, but it'll also generate a helper file with a class called R, just the single letter R. And the single letter R has inner classes for each type of resource. So it has for drawable, for color, for string, for um, different types of uh, themes and things like that. And you can reference those in your code by saying r dot whatever the type is dot something else. Let me just show you a quick example of that. If we went into our resources file for the strings, we can see here's a, here's a string representing our name of our application and his ID is app name. If I go into my main activity, you, you can see here how it says hello uh, name. Instead of that, I could say string resource r dot string dot app name. And what that's going to do is that's going to go and look up the resource that's a string named app name. And so it'll pull in the content of this room example or some other content based on the configuration that I'm in. Right now, that's the only place that app name appears. But if I came in here and said, give me a new directory, which I'll call value dash ES, oops, values, Let's see if I can do that right. And then if I made a copy of him inside there, I can come into here and translate it. So maybe I wanted to call this, um, I am completely blanking on what the, the name for room is in, in Spanish. I'm going to say hola. So it's just going to say hello. And then inside of uh, the application, if the user has set it so that Spanish is their language, they'll see hola come up at the screen as opposed to the, name, the room example. Um, and that's all done automatically for you. Uh, you can still use this in Jetpack Compose. It works really nice. This allows you to farm it out to other translators to change the text in the files. Okay, so we've got that guy. And now we're going to start talking about Rumor. Any questions on this before we actually start talking about databases? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. So let me find my database stuff here. And we're going to be using a toolkit called Room, which is uh, defined for Android. Um, and actually, before we do that, let me just kind of give you kind of the basic concept behind Room. Uh, the, the concept is that this is what's called an object relational mapping layer. And you're going to define some classes inside Kotlin put some annotations on them to say this is going to be used for room and it'll automatically generate your database and your tables for you uh, as well as actually query code to go against it so it's really nice it's fairly lightweight and thin it doesn't have super robust relationships uh, it has some that we're going to see that are pretty simple but if you're trying to do some pretty complex stuff you're going to have to do a little bit more manual work if we take a look at a typical application flow and, uh, and a way that we might layer our applications, uh, in this particular case, I have five layers. I have the actual database, which is going to hold my tables and my data. I have a room abstraction layer here. This is going to be some classes that are built by room based on my, my uh, entities that I've defined. I have an optional repository layer here. And the thing that's nice about the repository layer is let's say that uh, you're fetching data from a server. Uh, let's say it's data that doesn't change very often. What you can do is fetch the data from the server and then throw it into a local database. So he kind of acts as a, a, a choice point here. Anytime you ask him for data, he can go to the local database and see if he has it already. If he does, he just returns it. 
Otherwise, he goes off to the server, pulls it down, stores the, the cache data locally, and returns it. And maybe he has some limits in there as far as how much data he stores in the database, so you're not taking up a lot of space. That can improve your performance, uh, assuming that the data on the server doesn't change very often. Okay. The view model is your way of, it's basically your bridge between the back end and the data, act, the data that you're accessing and the front end, your user interface. Up here, we're saying that we have an activity defining our user interface. Now, if we take a look at how the data flows through here, let's say that we're uh, going to display some data in the user interface. And we want to ask the room layer to get us a list of movies. So the activity will go through to the view model, through the repository, to the room layer to say, I want to get movies. And you know, typically what we're going to do is, let's say that's a list of movies you're going to want to display anytime it changes. Typically, you would initialize that in the repository saying, get movies. And he's going to create something called a flow for you. Uh, you could also use live data, but I really don't want to get into to that. I want to uh, prefer using flows. Flow is a construct in Kotlin that's part of the coroutines package. And coroutines in, in Kotlin are their way of doing background threads. And it's really super nice. Uh, you're gradually going to uh, get more and more information on it. I'm going to hand wave on it quite a bit up front. So up front, just think of it as it's, some, it's a function running in the background. And don't think much more about it. A flow is a pipeline between one or more uh, uh, coroutines. And so this pipeline will let you emit values from somebody who's going to get, who actually has data, or collect values on the receiver end. So what we're going to do here is the repository says get movies, which is going to immediately return this flow object. And the flow object can get passed all the way up to the user interface, at which point the user interface says, let me call collect. And what collect does is waits until there's a value. As soon as he sees a value, you perform whatever logic you've set up. So generally what you're going to do is set up your collect so that when the data comes through, you update your user interface. Behind the scenes, well, and in that case there, you typically start with an empty list of data so or an empty piece of data. So the user interface would have you no know, data to start with. Behind the scenes from this Git Movies, it kicks off a job in the database to fetch some data. Once that data has been retrieved, it gets emitted to the flow, which then percolates up to the user interface. User interface collects it and updates the interface on the screen. That's a really nice set of setup there. Um, behind the scenes, what's really cool is anytime the data changes, it set up a trigger in the database so that when the data changes, it can update that flow automatically. So if later on we created a movie or deleted a movie, the new set of data is going to be sent across representing the either that uh, list of data with the movie missing or the list of data with a new movie inside of it. On the activity side, when the user interacts, typically you're going to be performing some data changes. I mean, otherwise, you're not doing a whole lot in the application. Uh, you know, it might be a read-only application, and that's cool. But most applications are going to actually want to change some data. So whenever the user changes data, it's going to perform an insert, update, or delete. And those are going to get passed down to the room layer, who's actually going to do the database update. That database update may, may trigger a change, which will pass data back up to the user interface. So there's a lot of nice automation here that makes your life a little bit simpler. So Room itself is very, very simple object persistent. There's only one row per object. So when you define an object, it can't be a combination of a bunch of rows. It represents one row in a database in a single, in a single table. Now there are some relations they've added in. We'll see those in a little bit. But think of it as an object represents a row in a single table. You'll set this up using some annotations, and then the Room compiler will automatically build all the code behind the scenes that it needs to do its job. You can have your DAO, that's your data access object that you define, either return a direct object or a list of objects, and that would be synchronous communication. So when you call it, you're going to wait until the data is fetched from the database and comes back to you. You should only, only ever do that off the user interface thread. If you do it on the user interface thread, the problem is 
the, you're tying up the user interface thread so it can't refresh the screen. It can't respond or react to the user's taps and things like that. That can create a very janky user experience where things can stutter and they just don't look or act right. So if you're doing synchronous functions, you want to make sure that you kick them off off of the user interface thread. Now, you also have the option of having your functions return a Kotlin flow, in which case, when you call it, you immediately get the flow back. And you can also kind of think of it as a bucket. The data will be dropped in the bucket. When you see new data in the bucket, you can consume it. Um, then behind the scenes, Room kicks off the processing in, in a thread off of the user interface so that you can get the data once it's ready and not tie up the user interface thread. The automated relations are pretty... Uh, limited. They uh, have gotten a little bit better uh, the, with the last release, the last major release 2.4 of, of Room. Um, but one thing you want to be careful about is the automated relations are actually going to kick off multiple queries. Because of that, you want to make sure that you mark them as transactions. Uh, and I have seen some lint rules that will catch that and say, hey, you forgot to put the transaction process on there, the transaction annotation on there. The dependencies, if you take a look at developerandroid.com, Jetpack, Android X, Releases Room, you'll see the uh, uh, the version of, of Room that you might want to use. Um, the version you're going to use for this course is going to be uh, specified in the examples, and I'm, and I'm going to be updating that for online versions of the course. I strongly recommend you use the KSP version of the, of the Room compiler instead of the KAPT one. And definitely don't use the annotation processor. Now that probably doesn't mean anything to you. Let me explain. Annotation processor is a tool written in Java that scans your code, finds the annotations, and generates code based on that. The original Room setup used the annotation processor to generate Java classes to do whatever your work you need. With Kotlin, they created the KAPT, that's the Kotlin Annotation Processing Tool. And that's a separate tool that, again, would read all of your classes, look at the annotations, and then generate code. KSP is a much nicer way to do that. That's called the Kotlin Symbol Processor. And this is actually part of the Kotlin Compiler. So you can contribute symbol processors that run when the Kotlin Compiler itself is running. So it's much more efficient. You're not doing an entirely separate scan of all the code. Um, one of the, the most expensive parts of any type of build is reading in the code, parsing it to figure out what it means, generating what they call an abstract syntax tree, representing your code structure, and then doing processing on the abstract syntax tree. What the Kotlin symbol processor does is he gets the same tree that the compiler uses for other, other work so that all the parsing is shared between the two. So it can be much faster than KAPT or the annotation processor. There are three different main types of components you're going to have to work with inside Room. Entities are classes that represent a table inside the database. And you annotate that with the entity annotation. Data access objects are your CRUD queries, your create, read, update, and delete queries. And that'll be annotated with the at sign DAO annotation. Database is a class that just groups together which entities you want to belong to your database. It'll create the tables for those, and then you also set up a version and possibly some migration strategies for it. Um, inside the, this actually should be up in the DAO, this can return flows. I'm not sure why it's down there. Um, but the, the data access object can return flows for asynchronous processing. So returning flows or not, a couple little little things to keep in mind if you want to just return an object directly or if you want to return a flow. Um, returning a flow, you can call that from the user interface thread because then you're just going to get that flow back. It acts as a bucket with the data. When the data is ready, you can react to it. Um, you don't need to wait for the result. You can just say, boom, get, let me know when it's changed. This sets up a more reactive user interface where the user interface says, anytime I see new data, I refresh myself as opposed to a more imperative database or imperative user interface, which is where you're going to ask questions, get the response, and immediately update the screen. And that typically will end up slowing down your user interface, making it janky or stuttery. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is that you can get automatic updates when the database changes. Now, as far as returning a single object, this is something that you have to do from a worker thread if you want to keep performance. 
Uh, otherwise, your user interface can suffer quite a bit. The big advantage to this side is you can use it in a larger transaction. So if you think of something like doing a bank account transfer, where you're going to fetch a value from one account, deposit, you know, add it, to, uh, fetch the balance from one account, add it to a different account, and then subtract it from the first account. And you want that to happen in one single transaction. So you really have three kinds of queries going on there, you know, fetches and updates. And you want to make sure that that's all in a single transaction. And you don't want to have to do some kind of weird asynchronous waiting, which is what this one would do here. So you're basically just going to get a value, update, update, end my transaction. Note that the database will not automatically update in this case. When you call these, you're going to immediately get a value back. That's the end of the story. Nothing else happens after that. So let's talk a little bit about object relations in a database and how different types of entities relate to each other. Uh, you may or may not be aware of some of this, but I wanted to go over it and then talk about how we're going to model, the, model these relationships inside Room. Um, so basically a relation is a connection between two different tables uh, or you know between multiple different tables potentially. Um, and each of those connections can have different cardinalities. And what that means is how many objects are on either side of those connections. So if you have a one-to-one -one relationship, you're talking about one entity relates to exactly another, another entity in a different table and vice versa. There's only going to be one of each. An example of this, maybe if we have an entity representing an IMDB identifier, uh, you know, the identifier might be, it might have an ID associated, it might have some information about when it was created, something like that. Um, so each movie would have one IMDB identifier, and each IMDB identifier would have exactly one movie. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, a lot of times one-to-one -one relationships are just represented as columns in a table. But if you have more data and you don't necessarily want to fetch all the data all the time, you can have that uh, pushed out into a different table and just link the two. A one-to-many relationship is one where on one side of the situation you have an entity that's related to multiple of a different type of entities, and each of those other guys is related back to the first one, and only the first one. An example here is let's say that we have something representing an MPAA movie rating, something like you know PG-13, R, G, all those different types of ratings. Each of those ratings can be applied to multiple movies. But each movie has exactly one, one of those ratings. So this is a one-to-many where the one side is the movie, the multiple side, I'm sorry, the, the one side is the MPA rating, the multiple side are the movies. And a many-to-many -many relationship is much more complex. Uh, this is where you might have a movie having zero or more actors, and each actor might be in zero or more movies. And so you can have these cross products between them. This is typically represented with an additional table that just keeps track of the link between things. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, how these might be uh, might look in in an entity diagram. Um, so general syntax on this: when you see a one-to-one -one relationship, you'd see a little number one on each side of the, the relationship line. If you have a one-to-many relationship, you'd see a one on one side and a star on the other. The star in this case means zero or more. If you used a plus there instead, it would mean one or more. A many-to-many -many relationship, you'd have a star on both sides of it. So for example, in our movie example here, I'm not going to put in the IMDB identifier for this. We're just going to talk about ratings, movies, and actors. So we'll have a rating entity. There'd be exactly one of those associated with multiple movies. And each of those movies has one rating. So you can represent that one-to-many relationship like this. Uh, between a movie and an actor, it's a many-to-many -many relationship, so we have a star on both sides of those. To make that work, what we really need is another little table in the middle here that's going to associate each movie with each actor. We can't just put data inside each of these movie and actor objects here um, because it... Uh, you then would be assuming there's one true version of somebody else. We're gonna that would be a one to something relationship. If we throw some column data in here, it's gonna to start to make become a little bit more clear. Let's say our rating has an ID and a name, and the ID is just representing a unique identifier for that rating. The movie has an ID, but also has a rating ID column. 
the rating ID is the thing that keeps track of which rating he has. And this is the most common way to represent a one-to-many relationship. On the many side, you have the ID, an extra field representing the ID of the thing on the one side. And we might have some other data here, like title and description. So on the actor side over here, we have an ID and a name. So he's pretty simple. But we need to relate those back and forth together. So we create this table in the middle here. And this table has a movie ID and an actor ID. This lets us have any combination of movies and actors that we want. And we might also have some other information inside there, like character and order and credits, so that when we pull this data out, we can actually format it nicely on the screen. If we start linking these, we start seeing how the relationships are set up. So whenever we're querying against the rating and movie table, we're going to join based on the ID of the rating and the rating ID of the movie. When we're looking at this middle table, we're going to join from the ID of the movie to the movie ID in the role, the ID in the actor to the actor ID in the role. And this way we can kind of bridge between to get information. Now, depending on what type of tool set you're using or if you're just using raw squeal, uh, by the way, squeal is the way I pronounce SQL, uh, we'll see that in the role class here, we have some extra data. Now in room, I've tried to come up with some good ways to, to use this in room. It doesn't quite work this way. You can't actually have data in the association class here. What we need to do is pull that extra data out into a separate class called, I'm going to call it role details here. Uh, and so this way, when we're creating our, our hops between movie and something else, we can hop between movie and act a list of actors. We can hop between movie and a list of role details. And role details can hop between the role detail and a list of movies or a list of actors. So you can associate these in several ways, and this seems to work out pretty well. <clears throat> now we can add in that repository layer that I talked about up front. This adds an extra layer of indirection that can really be helpful for certain types of operations. You know, maybe you want to have the repository simply allow alternatives. So maybe I go across the network to get data, or I go to a local database, depending on what's installed. Maybe I do some caching where the repository goes off to the service. Actually, the repository looks locally first. And if he doesn't see the data, he then goes off to the web service, gets the data, and stores it locally for next time. Um, sometimes you just don't need anything like this. It just would be a, an extra layer. For our example and for our assignment, we're going to use them, keeping in mind that the example we're writing really isn't going to take advantage of it. It really doesn't need it. But I want you to get used to having it in there if you want to have that choice of going to different places or caching things. Okay, any questions on anything so far? Okay, so I am going to open this guy up and throw him on the side because I was working on him. And he might be helpful. We're going to take this room example and start actually implementing some of this. And there's going to be a lot of things that we have to do to make this work. Um, it's probably going to take up most of the time, but we shall see how it goes. And we're going to put a really super simple user interface on top of this to try to allow us to test us and kind of navigate through things. Um, later on for the next assignment, we're going to improve the user interface, uh, make it something you can actually interact with and edit data. Right now, it's just going to be for browsing data. So what I want to start with is an inside of here with the room example. I'm going to create a new package, and I'm going to call data. And this is where I'm going to put most of my entities and things like that. So what I want to do is I want to start off with some really simple basic entity data, or entity classes. So I'm going to come in here and say new Kotlin class file. I'm going to call it actor. And that gives me this actor class. And I'm just going to throw at entity on top of this. But oops, it's not available. I need to bring in the dependency for rooms. So let's, let's open up a browser here. And I'm going to say Android room uh, de cradle dependency. There we go. And so I'm going to come over to room. 
And inside here, it's going to show some dependency information. Now, there's actually, uh, in this version of this page, there's actually a little bug. I've got to put a uh, request in where it's not showing the KSP or the, the KPT versions of things. So I'm going to go over to where it says Kotlin, and they actually have those listed. And I'm just going to grab these guys. And let's go back over to our room example. And I'm going to go to this build.gradle underneath the application and scroll down to the dependencies section. I'm going to paste that in. So the room version I'm using as of the point of this video is 2.4.2. .2. This syntax is actually for what we call the, the, the Kotlin domain specific language for Gradle. It won't work in Gradle as is. Actually, I think it will, to be honest. Um, but I'm just going to change this. And we don't want to use the annotation processor version of this. So I'm going to delete that. We don't want to use KAPT. I'm going to delete that. I want to use KSP. So I'm just going to change it kind of like that. Now, in order to use KSP, though, we need to tell the build scripts that we want to use KSP. So the way we do that is in the top level build script, let me come back to him, build.gradle. A few things I'm going to change in here version wise. I want to change my compile version to 111 and my Kotlin version to 1610. These versions, depending on when you're looking at the video, I'm you know look at the the um, look at the syllabus to see which versions you should be using. But I also want to add in one more dependency here for the plugins called Com Google DevTools KSP. And this is the Kotlin symbol processor that Google provides. The version as of the time of this video is 1610-102. Uh, and this just means that he is a, a symbol processor that works with version 1610 of Kotlin. And the version of the symbol processor is 102. So we set that guy up. Let's go back over to the main build.gradle here. And I'm going to fix some of these up as well. I'm just going to click on them and hit Alt-Enter to change the version. I'm not going to touch the composed version ones because those are we already fixed that. And I'm going to fix these other guys. And now we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and say up here at the top, we need to include Com Google DevTools KSP. And what I've done is at the very top level build.gradle, in here, we're saying which versions of each of these plugins we want to use so that when I reference them in the sub projects, it'll always use the same version. The apply faults here says don't use these plugins as part of this top level build script. Only use them when you actually specify them in the lower level build script. So up here, note that he doesn't have a version. He doesn't say apply faults. It's going to apply that plugin for our use here. And I think everything else is okay in here. Let's do a sync now. This is going to reread in those build scripts, synchronize that information with Android Studio, and we should see all of this uh, yellow go away. My machine's a little slow tonight. It's usually faster than this. Any questions so far while we're waiting for this? Ah, there we go. Okay, let's see what he's complaining about here. Oh, the uh, the syntax there, because I grabbed the, jo the um, Kotlin syntax. That should be def in Gradle. Let me try again. Now he seems a little happier. 
I'm guessing that just ends up ended up confusing the the processing. Okay, so now we have him. Let's go back to to actor. And I'm going to hit Control Space after Entity, and boom, I have an option. Hit Enter there. So now we have an actor entity, but he doesn't have any data inside of him. So what I'm going to do here is use the constructor syntax for parameters or for properties. And I'm going to say this guy's going to be a primary key. Uh, why is he not? Hmm, that's interesting. Because primary key should be available. That's in the same package as there. Now he sees him, but what is he complaining about? Oh, because I don't have the var in there yet. Is he going to be happy now? Yeah. So apparently it's it's targeted so you can't have it on a value parameter. That's interesting. Um, it's a good thing because it needs to be able to be changed. So we're going to define the primary key as a string. And I want to generate a random string for this. Uh, but I want to make sure that random string isn't going to conflict with anybody else. So what I'm going to do is use a UUID for this. It's called a universally unique identifier. And I'm going to say UUID.randomUUID.toString, and boom. I now have something that will be unique, whether I created it here or created it somebody, someplace else. Um, if you just use integers, two different users could create something with the same ID. And if you ship that up to a server to store, you're going to have some conflicts. So we're going to make sure that that identifier is unique. Put him in there. And then I'm going to say give me a name. That's going to be a string as well. So here's a really simple Apple actor representation. <coughs> now let's add a movie. And I'm going to say, give me a data class. Oops. Movie. I'm going to make him an entity as well. And then for my movie, he's going to be a primary key, var ID, string equals UUID, random UUID to string. Okay, this is Android Studio screwing up because it's not letting me pull that in. So I'm going to have to copy them. I don't know what's going on with that. Every once in a while, Android Studio gets a little out of sync with itself, but it's it's there. It's perfectly fine. So let's put in here of our name, actually title for the movie. And there we go. We have a couple nice little entities to deal with to start with. Um, let's add a little bit more information here. Let's do a description as well. And let's set up our first relationship between this and a rating. So I'm going to create a rating. This is going to represent that MPAA rating, Motion Picture Association of America. And he's going to have, I'm just going to copy the data from over here. Boom. So now we have an ID for him, a name, and a description of the rating as well. And what we'd like to do is create that one-to-many relationship between movies and ratings. So what we're going to do is add the rating ID to the movie. Remember, you're going to want to add the thing that is going to be the many as an ID inside the thing that's going to be the one. So if we go to the movie here, I can add in a var rating ID. It's going to be a string. And boom. This will create my link back to that rating for me. So we now have our objects that we wanted to create there. We need to now deal with that many-to-many -many relationship. It's going to be a little bit more complex. To do that, we need an extra entity involved. I'm going to say, give me a Kotlin class file here. I'm going to call it a role. And inside there, we'll say he's going to be an entity. 
data class role. And he's going to have two IDs inside of him. So we're going to have var movie ID. It's going to be a string. And actor ID is going to be another string. These two fields together are going to be unique. So I can't just throw primary key in front of them. By using the primary key in front of it, that only applies to if that field itself is the thing that determines uniqueness. For the roles, the uniqueness is going to be the combination of these two guys. So what we're going to need to do is add in uh, an, a specification to the entity up here to tell us what the primary keys are. So I'm going to come into here and I'm going to say primary keys equals actor ID and movie ID. So that combination makes it unique. Now to make our lookup faster, we can add indices here as well. With the amount of data we're going to put in this application, we don't really need to, but it's something I wanted to show you how you can do. And so I can have an index and we'll just do him on movie ID. So we're going to create an index based on the movie ID. And we'll do one on the actor ID as well. Now we can also set up things so that we get some automated deletion. So if the actor gets deleted, then all of these role things get removed automatically. If the movie gets deleted, all these, all these guys get deleted as well. So to do that, we can just put in a foreign key specification here. Uh, why is he not? Huh. Again, Android Studio is, is messing with me. Sometimes I have good days with Android Studio. Other times, not so good. And there it is. So it's working just fine. He just wouldn't find him. So uh, this foreign key inside here is going to have a few little things here. I'm going to say entity equals actor. So the thing that this actor ID is relating to is an actor entity. I'll say actor.class. You just put some metadata in to say what type of entity it is. And the parent column is going to be ID. So if we're, if we're starting from the actor coming to this role, the actor's ID needs to match up with the actor ID whoops, inside of this role. And now we're going to put a couple little uh, rules in here to say what to do if that ID changes or if that is deleted. So I'm going to say on update is going to be foreign key dot cascade. And I'm going to do the same thing for delete. And that says anytime the actor changes, I want to automatically update or delete the role. Uh, this is the real important thing here. We're making sure that this guy can't exist unless the actor exists, which is a good thing. And then that way we don't have to worry about all sorts of extra deletions that we have to manually manage. We're going to let the database take care of that for us. I'm going to do the same kind of thing for the movie. So that if the movie's deleted, we'll automatically delete this. Because obviously if the movie doesn't exist, you can't have that relation. Okay, so that's our role. Uh, and that's the main information we're going to do right now. I'm not going to add in the extra data here yet as far as the character name and the order in the credits. We're going to add that in a little bit later. But uh, any questions so far? Okay, let's take a look at our DAO. I'm going to create a new class here. I'm going to call movie DAO. And this guy, I'm going to annotate him with DAO. And of course, during the break, I'm going to try to uh, refresh the project by cleaning up all the, the metadata and re-importing it. And hopefully that 
issue will go away. So we're going to define this as a DAO, and I'm going to make him an abstract class. You can either use an interface or an abstract class here. The reason you need to do this is so that the room compiler can create a subtype of it, which is going to be the real actual the real DAO. And then that way he actually fills in the details of what all the functions do for us. By making it abstract, we can actually have some concrete functions in here, uh, as opposed to if we had it an interface. Well, I guess the interface in Kotlin you can. I'm just not sure if that'll work with the room compiler. Um, so we're going to define my movie DAO. And then we're going to put in some queries here. Let's start off simple with just fetching the entire sets of movies and the entire sets of uh, actors. So I'm going to start up here by saying at query, which, oh, hey, it actually found that one. How about that? And that's going to be some squeal I'm going to put in those quotes. So I'm just going to leave it like that for the moment. But let's define an abstract function here that's going to let us get all of the ratings and get all of the actors and get all of the movies. So I'm going to say get ratings. And I'm going to say get ratings flow. This is going to allow us to return immediately with a flow that acts as a bucket for putting the data in. And then behind the scenes, it's going to kick off the actual work to get the data and then throw the data in that bucket. So we're going to call it like this. And we're going to say flow. And it's going to use Kotlin coroutines flow. And it's going to be on list of ratings, just like that. So just by defining it like this, that's going to automatically do that background processing for us. It'll generate a function to do that. But we do need a query up here to say what to do. So I'm going to say select star from rating. Boom. That's all we need to specify. So he's going to fetch all of the data, return a list. And then if anything changes, so if somebody inserts a new rating or if somebody deletes a rating, it's going to refetch that, drop it in the flow for us to show us the new thing. Now, I'm not going to get into to paging in here. There's a really nice paging library in Android, which if you know you're going to have a lot of data, you're going to want to use. You don't want to fetch the entire list of everything every time if the data set's large. For this example, this is perfectly fine, though. Now, I'm going to do the same kind of thing for the movie. Come on. Hit the right key on the keyboard there. And the actors. Just like that. So now we have some uh, nice simple ways to fetch that type of data. And let's talk about what the updates and the deletes look like for this. So I can define a function called insert taking a varying length argument list of, let's say, ratings, just like that. And then I just throw insert on top of that. And I need to make that abstract. There we go. And I can do the same thing for movies and actors. And then I can do almost exactly the same thing for updates and deletes. So this one's going to become update. And this one's going to become delete. Really? You're going to let me do insert and, and delete, but not update? There we go. So they kind of like that. So now we have our four CRUD operations. We have ways of getting all the data. We have ways of updating it, or inserting new ones, updating existing, or deleting existing. So really simple way of specifying our DAO. Let's go ahead and create a little user interface that's going to let us see all of our movies and our actors and our ratings. 
eventually we're going to set this up so you can actually click on them to get to individual pieces of it. So let's go to our main activity. I'm just going to go ahead and put all the code in the main activity for now. Uh, normally we're going to want to split this out a little bit more, but a lot of times when I'm starting a Compose application, I'll do a lot of it inside here and then gradually split it out into groups of screens. Uh, so let's come into here and take a look at what we're going to want to define for screens. Um, let me define a view model. So new Kotlin class, I'm going to call it movie view model. And we're going to have a class movie. Oh, what am I doing? Movie view model. And he's going to extend an Android view model. An Android view model is one that's going to give us access to an application context. The application context is useful for pulling out resources and finding uh, information on how to interact with the file system for, uh, for Android, which we're going to need to create our database. So I'm going to create that Android view model. And you'll notice if I float over this guy, he's saying he has a constructor and must be initialized. So what I'm going to do is Alt Enter on him and choose this Add Constructor Parameters from Android View Model Application, which is going to give us a application parameter and then pass it into there. So this allows the Android View Model to keep track of the application. So inside here, we're going to have some stuff to be able to get our, uh, our data from the, the DAO and from our database. Oh, speaking of which, we need to define our database. Movie database. So inside here, I'm going to have class, whoops, let's do that, class movie database, which is going to extend room database, which, of course, Thank you, Android Studio. Let's add that import in explicitly. There we go. And this guy is responsible for tying together the entities and creating a DAO for us. So to start with, and he needs to be abstract. So to start with, I'm going to say, define a database. And again, of course, glad I have my other example up there. So I can just copy those imports over. And this database definition is first of all going to have which version we're in. Anytime that version changes, if the version that's being used in the application and memory is different from the version of the database on the disk, it's going to try to trigger a migration. And you can define hints about the migration inside here. It can be references to other code that's going to perform migration for you or it could just be a reference to say, I want to automatically migrate. Uh, if all you're doing is adding some columns and things like that, if you're adding things, an auto migration works really nicely. As soon as you end up renaming things or deleting things, the auto migration is going to fail. It just won't work. You'll need to define some instructions on how to do that. Uh, so we got our version one. Let's add in our entities. And I'm going to say we have movie class actor class, uh, let's see, role class, uh, rating class. There we go. So now we have all of those. Those are going to become the tables that Room's going to create for us. And we also need to tell it if we want it to export a schema or not. I'm going to say false. Um, if you're doing migrations, you're going to need to have a schema exported, if you, especially if you're doing an auto migration. Um, or if you just want to see what the database schema looks like, you can set up that up to export. Um, but then we have to configure in our build where that gets exported to. Finally, in here, I'm going to say abstract. Whoops. Fun DAO is going to be a movie DAO. Just kind of like that. And this will allow it to create that instance of the movie DAO and manage it and hand it to us anytime we say db.dao. So that takes care of our, our DAO uh, and our uh, database definition. Let's add in a repository. And I'm just going to go ahead and put it up at this level. So Kotlin class file, movie repository. 
Um, but the actual definition of the repository is just going to be an interface. So I'm just going to describe what I want this thing to do, and then I'm going to have a specific implementation that goes to the database. Uh, this allows you to swap in or out different implementations. Maybe you want a different implementation that goes only against a web service, and we'll see that later on in the course. We're going to replace this so that we can actually just live hit a web service to get some data. So inside here, let's see, what am I going to need in him to start with? Let's give it a way to get the, um, the those different flows that we had. So I'm going to say val ratings flow, which is going to be a flow of a list of a rating. Whoops. Be really careful when you import flow. You'll notice how I accidentally imported Java Util concurrent flow. You don't want that one. You want the one that is the Kotlin coroutines. Otherwise, things are really not going to work. So we're going to say ratings, movie flow, and actors. Kind of like that. So that gives us a, uh, <coughs> a kind of a nice function there. And I'd also like to have a function here to reset the database. Now, whenever you get into something like this, this is an operation that's going to insert a bunch of things. It might clear the database, then insert a bunch of things. Um, whenever you're doing that, you want to do it off the user interface thread. So we could set it up so that this function you know, does whatever work we do, and something, whoever calls him, kicks off that, that uh, background work. Or we could kick off the background work here. Unfortunately, at this point, we really don't have enough information to be able to know how to create that background work. So what we want to do using Kotlin coroutines is we're going to declare this guy something called a suspend function. And one of the things that's neat about a suspend function is that you have to run it inside a coroutine. You have no choice. Um, whereas if you're doing just normal threads in Java, you can't make a, a declaration like that. You can't say this code has to run inside of a thread. It's just a function. This is saying this code has to run inside a coroutine. That's pretty cool. And we'll see in our implementation, we can actually go a step further and tell it which dispatcher to run on. So in, in coroutines, you have several groups of threads that will run your code. You have a main dispatcher, which is your user interface thread. You have an IO dispatcher, which sets up some threads to handle blocking IO, such as networking or reading from a file, reading from a database. Um, and you have a default dispatcher, which is just used for just general work, any type of general background computation or something like that. <coughs> um, what we're requiring here is our caller to actually start a coroutine. So he's basically going to say, I want to kick some stuff off in the background. And for now, all I need you to know about coroutines is that they run in the background. A suspend function forces you to run it in the background. And just a little note about him, he also gives a point for that coroutine to be automatically suspended by the coroutines, function, the coroutines framework, which gives different other coroutines a chance to run. One of the things about coroutine processing is it's cooperative, uh, uh, cooperative multitasking versus what we normally use, uh, which is uh, preemptive multitasking. The difference is with cooperative multitasking, your background process has to participate and has to be a good participant. He has to yield once in a while to give somebody else a chance to have some CPU time. Um, the neat thing about coroutines is by using suspend functions, the framework takes care of that yield for you. With preemptive multitasking, the CPU handles that for you. He has multiple threads that he's managing, and he just splits off a little bit of time to each thread ind independently. So you as a programmer don't have to worry about it. So coroutines, cooperative, uh, pre uh, everything else, you know, the more modern stuff is preemptive. Um, but I think coroutines actually makes things so much easier in so many ways and has the suspend capability that automatically yields for you. It really isn't something where the cooperative uh, functionality of it becomes a problem. Um, so this guy is actually going to load some data in the database for us. Let's create a implementation of him. 
I'm going to call it movie repository. Make him a class. Oh, what is the Oh, <laughs> movie database repository. Yeah, of course it's not going to let me recreate the same class there. Movie database repository. And he's going to implement movie repository, which means we need to actually implement those members. Boom, I'll put them in there like that. And let's take a look at what I'm going to do inside there. Where is, there's reset database. So I'm just going to copy him and replace it here. Oops. There we go. So here's how I want my reset database to look here. I'm going to have the DAO do the actual work for us. We'll set that up in a little bit. But the main thing here is that I'm going to have a suspend function that forces things to run on the IO dispatcher. And this is one of the things I love the most about, about Kotlin coroutines is that you can force it to run somewhere. Whereas with Java, you, you know, you just have a function and there's no way to ensure if it's running on a UE thread or if it's running on a background thread, or if it's running in a certain group of threads, this allows you to, to guarantee that. Um, but notice I need a database instance. So let's go ahead and create a little database instance up here. Boom. So I'm going to have this database guy here using room database builder. And in order to do this, I need a, a context from Android, something where I can get to the resources, I can get to the file system. And I don't have one. So I'm going to need to pass that in here. I can say val context. Actually, I'm just going to say application is an application. And then boom, I now have that. I'm going to make him private as well because we don't need other people to be able to see him from the outside. And we'll pull in our movie database that we defined. Note that room was defined using Java. So the metadata to be able to get to uh, the class files and things like that has to be Java metadata. So what we're going to do is we're going to say movie database colon colon class, which gives us the Kotlin metadata representing that class. And then from there, we can say, give me the Java version of that metadata. Finally, I'm going to put inside here the name of the file that we're going to use under the covers to hold that database. It's going to be called movies. And that builds my database. So now we'll see what I can get from the database. I can get the DAO and call reset database. So we need to go back to our DAO and define that reset database function. And let's copy all this because I don't want to type all of that again. So we're going to come over here and put this down near the bottom a little bit, give it some room. This is basically going to be loading up the database. I'm going to comment this guy out for the moment until we have that extra information. <coughs> but let's see what we have here. Well, first of all, we need to clear our movies, clear our actors, and clear our roles. This is going to be deleting everything from those tables. The easiest way to do that, I mean, if we used room just as is, we'd have to say, give me all the data and then pass the, all those objects to the delete function, which would be pretty horrible. What we can do instead is kind of trick the query into doing it for us. Delete from movie, for example. And then this will be abstract fun clear movies. And then we can do the same kind of thing for those other tables, actors and ratings. Oops, just actor, rating. And then we have that other one, which was role. Kind of like that. So you have actors, movies, roles, and ratings. There we go. And then I actually need to insert data into the application. So what I did here is I just created some constants for that, which I will copy over. 
And notice I'm just going to put them up here at the top of the file. These are top-level declarations. They can be accessed anywhere. Behind the scenes in Java, it's actually going to create a class called MovieDAOKT, and these will be fields inside there. But you don't have to actually do anything special there. You're just going to reference not rated G, PG, PG13, and so on. So I'm just creating instances of these entity objects, giving them an ID, giving them name, a description, and so on. So I'm pre-populating my database. So down in here, I'm going to insert all those guys. And this calls that insert function that we defined here, just taking in that varying length argument list. We could do the same thing for defining the movies. So we're going to define our movies, define our actors, and our relationships between those guys. Okay, so this one here, let me, for the moment, I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and put the um, role details ID in there. It's going to store it in there. It's not going to hurt us, though. Um, but ignore him for the moment. We're going to add that data in a little bit. That'll just make this compile nicely. Um, and did I not have an insert for role yet? I don't think I did the roles up here yet. Nope. So we'll say roles, role, and then down here, roles, role, and then we'll do the delete as well. Roles, role. Okay. So I think we're good there for setting this data up. And we're going to set in our user interface. We'll just have a little button that lets us do that reset. And so it'll create the data for us. <clears throat> OK, so let's see. So that's the DAO with the reset. The repository should be good now. So we have all this. Well, actually, we didn't do these guys yet here. So let's fix those up. So inside here, I'm going to say equals db dot dow dot get ratings flow. And we'll do the same kind of thing down here for him equals db dot dow dot get movies flow. And then this one is going to be db dot dow dot get actors flow. Boom. So those are going to go grab those those buckets from the database. The database is going to kick off a job to actually fetch data. And once those are available, it's going to drop in. So we're going to start off with empty. There's not going to be anything retrieved from these yet. Uh, and the user interface will just not display anything to start with. OK. Any questions on anything before we move on? We'll take a break in just a couple minutes here. So we got this guy set up here. Let's go back to our view model. And now we can start putting data in here to be able to reach out. So we're going to need to get a hold of our repository here. I'm going to say private repository colon movie repository. Private val might, might help if I actually put a specifier there. So movie repository equals movie database repository passing in that application. There we go. So that will set up our data access. And now we can just use it directly. So in our view model, we're just going to grab those flows. Obviously, I used a different name in my prep, prep uh, setup there. So we're going to grab those flows to expose them to user, user interface. Uh, and then let's put a reset database call in there. Kind of like that. So we have a way to reset it. Note that this is a suspend function. Anytime you call a suspend function, this guy's a suspend function here, you have to be a suspend function. Uh, and you know the suspend functions must be called from a coroutine. So we've got him set up. Let's define some screens. 
We're not going to use all of these to start with, but I'm just going to copy them in. I'm setting up a interface called screen that just gives me a handle to a screen. And then I'm creating a bunch of objects in Kotlin. An object is a singleton. So it's just a single instance called main screen. That's a screen. Single instance called rating screen and so on. So using a sealed interface in Kotlin is kind of like using an enumeration. There's the only, uh, only subtypes of this screen are defined inside the same package. Uh, this way you can use them uh, exhaustively inside of a when statement, which is really great. I love that. So in order to track him, let's add in a couple little variables here to help us out. First of all, I'm going to define what we want to show to the user interface. So I'm creating something called a mutable state. In Jetpack Compose, a mutable state is a little bucket that he can observe. And whenever data gets put into that bucket, he then recomposes himself if he's referenced it. If he hasn't referenced it, then no big deal. But if you pass that screen into a function, the function will be recomposed, re-rendered to the screen if the screen changes. Um, then I'm just going to have a little stack here. I'm just going to use a simple list for my stack here. I'm going to start that list off as a main screen. Note that list of creates an immutable list, so you can't add or remove elements to it. So I'm making screen stack be a variable. And I'm keeping this private because I don't want to expose the actual stack. I only want to expose whatever the topmost element on the stack is. Um, so by making this a var, I can change the entire list each time. So I create a new list, adding or removing stuff. I'm then overriding the setter for this property in Kotlin. And the first thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and keep track of the value. So I'm going to use the backing field on that value to keep track of it. But then I want to update the screen variable. So this is one place that's actually pretty nice use of overriding a setter, is that whenever the stack changes, I want to make sure this guy is going to be the last element in that stack. And it, what, the way I'm doing it here is whatever's on the end is going to be the top of the stack. I'm using last or null to say if there is no last element, meaning the list is empty, just use a null. So on the user interface side, if he ever sees a null, he knows it's time to exit the application because the user has gotten off of the back stack. Now we also need some functions to be able to manipulate that stack from the user interface. So the interface, user interface can ask to push a screen on the stack. And all we do is say screen stack equals screen stack plus screen. So we're going to create a brand new list here by adding a screen at the end and then updating that variable. In my pop, I'm going to create a new list that is the same as the first one minus the last item. Drop last one removes the last item from the list. Okay, and I think that's about all we're going to need there for the moment. That sounds pretty good. So far, so good. Let's go to our user interface and start doing some interesting things here. So what I'd like to do is create, first of all, let's grab our view model. So I'm going to say private val view model by view models. Movie view model. Boom. And I don't need that guy there. Let's go print, print. So this view models delegate, anytime you say buy in Kotlin, you're creating a delegate. It's a little object that in this particular case is going to wait until somebody actually references view model before it goes and tries to look it up. We can't actually create the view model instance during initialization of the activity because we just don't have enough information yet. We're going to have to wait until later on when somebody references it. And by the time somebody references it, we've actually got a valid activity that we can get the application instance from. And then it'll create that automatically for us. So boom, there's our view model. Now I'm going to create a little composable function, which is your main unit of user interface in Jetpack Compose. Um, but I'm going to be a little hand wavy here. I'm not going to get in a lot of details on how Compose works. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but uh, for the most part, assume the user interface works. Don't worry too much about how it's done. I'm going to keep it as basic as I can. 
So inside of here, we want to go to the rating, the ratings flow, the movies flow, and the actors flow from the uh, uh, the view model, and we're going to call collect as state. I'm going to import him. And what this collect as state does is he's going to listen to the flow and convert it into a Jetpack Compose state object that he can listen to. So anytime that that flow changes, it updates the state. Anytime the state is updated, for example, view, view model screen updated when he's updated, it's going to reevaluate. This guy right now is not happy. The reason he's unhappy, if you take a look at him, he's going to say, State uh, blah, 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 has no method get value. Now that's going to seem like a whole lot of gibberish, but what's going on here? Anytime you say something by something, you're creating a delegate object. So this creates an object that's going to manage listening to that collected state for you. That object is going to be invoked anytime you, you get this value or you set this value. Now these are just vals, so the only thing you can do is get it. So anytime you get ratings, it's going to delegate it to this guy to do his job. So this guy will go and find it. Now, the object created by this doesn't have that get functionality set up. That get functionality is set up as an extension function in Kotlin. It's separate from the class itself. So what we need to do is we need to import it. And we can just click on this and hit Alt-Enter. And boom, it imports it for us because that was the only option was importing it. So far, so good. What we're also going to do here is take a look at that view model that screen. And remember, he was a Jetpack Compose state, which means anytime he changes, this function will now be reevaluated and recomposed on the screen. Uh, so basically, we just have to change that inside the view model, and boom, it's going to change this. And this little UE function that I'm creating is really intended as a top level navigation. So uh, I'm not using the navigation component that is defined for Jetpack Compose because it's um, it's all string based using URIs and I am really not keen on it. Um, the only time that it's super valuable is if you're doing uh, some complex navigation where you can jump into different parts of your application. At that point, I'd say use it. But an application like this and probably most applications you're going to write, uh, you can just use a really simple stack like I've defined to keep track of where you are, and it'll just make your life a lot easier. So inside here, we're going to say, if I don't have a screen, I'm going to call exit. And note that exit is passed in as a function here. When you're doing Jetpack Compose, your direction of your data, your data is unidirectional. So you're going to pass data in, like these guys, and you're going to pass in functions to, inter to respond to interactions. So when things happen inside here, we call functions. We don't actually ha do anything directly inside of here. So the caller is going to have to define what it means to exit the application. All we do is say, I'm just going to exit. I don't care how it's done. I'm just going to call it. Any of the other screens here, we're going to call some other composable functions to actually display those on the screen. So I'm going to copy some of these over here. I think I just need these ones. So that should be the first few main screen actors, movies, and ratings. And I'm just going to comment the rest of these out for the moment because we're not actually using those yet. Now let's look at these functions here. So main screen is just going to have some buttons on it that let you do things like uh, switch to other screens as well as, and I forgot to put this in here, reset the database. And so this one's going to be on reset. The functions I'm passing in here, this first one called push, is a function that takes a screen and does something with it. It doesn't return any value. This on reset is going to be a function that doesn't take any arguments and does something but doesn't return any value. So we'll see here, this one here is just going to become a on reset. Boom, kind of like that. And let me define this simple button. 
I put him in a little class, a little file I called common here. And uh, the, the way you define a button in Compose is you have a button with text on the inside. And I don't like writing all that every time. I like to simplify it. So I created this little simple button that takes text and takes an on-click. And it's just a little bit less to write each time. So inside here, we'll see this now works. I have a simple button called Ratings, and here's what to do. Simple button called Movies, here's what to do. Simple button called Actors, and here's what to do, and so on. So this column is just going to give us a vertical list of buttons. Now the user interface here is going to look gross. I'm not going to get into details like padding and things like that. So all these buttons are going to be squished up against each other. Don't worry about that. What we're concentrating on here is just the database access. So now we got him defined. Let's take a look at what we got down here. See if I can do these imports so they'll work. And I've just defined a super simple little list screen here. Definition of a list screen here, you take in a title and a list of items. And you have a little helper function here. He's a, an extension function on whatever type we're dealing with that says take that object and create a string out of it. Don't worry too much about the syntax of this. I'm going to talk more and more about these over time. Select is a function that says I want to select something. So I'm going to pass that in and do something with it. The user interface on this is super simple. It's a column with a slightly bigger text for the title. And then for each of the items, I'm going to have a text for whatever the title is for that uh, thing that we're displaying. A username, a title of a movie, the name of a rating, things like that. So then here are the screens that use that helper function. So the rating screen is going to say my title is ratings. I'm going to pass the ratings that was passed in as the items. In order to get the text, I'm just going to grab the name of the item. And then when I need to select something, call the selection function that was passed in. So notice how these really aren't doing anything for themselves. They're just passing calls up to actually be able to do the real work. All these functions really do is draw stuff. We're passing in the what to draw, and we're passing in the what to call when things change. And so these, these screens are virtually the same, ratings, actors, and movies. So we come back up here. We'll see that so far so good. We have the um, screens and so on. Now I'm just going to comment out these select calls that we haven't defined yet. And hopefully what we're going to see here is that when we uh, go to our main screen, we can push the buttons to do some stuff. And let's see, is there somebody here who's not happy? Uh, nothing passed for on reset. Oh, because I didn't do the on reset yet. Um, so the on reset is going to be view model dot reset database. Or actually what I can do, let me do it this way. I'm going to say push equals that, and then on reset equals that. Um, I think that should be good. Oh, he needs to be a suspend function, so I do need to actually do him in, inside some code. Okay, out we go. We'll just do him this way. There's a billion ways you can do everything. So what I need to do is this reset database. If I float over him, he's telling us it's a suspend function. You have to run him from a coroutine or another suspend function. So here I need to kick off a coroutine. Fortunately, I'm passing one in. So I'm going to say inside here, scope.launch. Boom. That starts a coroutine. <clears throat> and then we're just going to call our suspend function inside of it. The suspend function itself behind the scenes is choosing which dispatcher to run on. If I really wanted to choose up front here, I could say dispatchers.io. But it doesn't really matter because this guy is actually doing that explicitly. If there's other work in here I wanted to do on the IO dispatcher before or after that reset database call, this could be useful. But since it's only calling the one thing, you really don't need to specify it. 
Okay, so now we got him. That's our little Yui. Let's go up to where we're going to call him inside here. And I'm just going to copy what I, well, really wasn't a whole lot to copy there. <clears throat> there we go. I need to define that scope. So I'm going to come in here and say val scope equals remember coroutine scope. Don't worry about this remember coroutine scope. I'm going to talk about remember later. It's a whole ball of wax. But this just gets a hold of a coroutine scope, something that can launch coroutines. I'm going to pass it in, pass my view model in, and the what to do when the user exits. Boom. So far, so good. And you'll notice that this user interface, real simple stuff. And it's going to give us a, a fairly useful user interface to do some work. Let's try running this, see if it works. Cross your fingers. Every once in a while, I get it right the first time, but there's bound to be a little something in there that's not going to work. If it does work on the first time, you'll be all the more impressed with me. Any questions while we're building? I know you're getting the fire hose treatment as far as so much data coming at you. Um, oh, little something wrong. Oh, I need to add in the Kotlin coroutines artifact. Okay, so let's go to the build.gradle for the project for the uh, application, and I have not pulled in any coroutine stuff. So what I'm going to do is get my browser up here. I'm going to say Kotlin coroutines Android dependency. And here is this guy. Let's go ahead and just copy him. And I think, or actually, what is it? Um, oh, the room KTX is what it was complaining about. Okay, so not the coroutines one. So I've got this room runtime. I'm just going to make a duplicate of him and say room KTX. KTX stands for Kotlin Extensions. And let's try syncing that. See if he's happy. The application as a whole is a lot to take in, but everything makes sense so far. Cool. I like it when that happens. Um, but yeah, it's like my philosophy on teaching is that uh, I'm going to throw a ton of data at people. And I basically am teaching by drowning. So you're going to have a lot more to take in than you really can. But hopefully the idea is that you've heard all the pieces so that later on, when you need to come back and look, you can. You're going to, you know, I, I don't like to just teach just the amount of stuff that you can hit the ground running with, because then you're not going to have a whole lot at the end of the course. Um, there's going to be a good core that you will be able to hit the ground running with. But um, let me try hitting running here again on this. Um, but there's going to be a lot of corners that you're going to have heard stuff about, and that's going to stick in your head. So here we go. Hopefully it'll run this time. And then we'll take a little break. And then after the break, we'll add some more stuff. And boom, we have an application. Oh, it has some default spacing between those. Uh, so we've got ratings, movies, actors. I'm going to hit reset DB first, just so we get some data to look at. And then we'll click on ratings. And we have not rated G, PG, PG-13, and R. So far, so good. Let's go back. Whoops. Um, he came out a little sooner than I expected him to. So let's see. So I pushed... that rating screen, when we came back, it should do a pop back to the main screen. So let's take a quick peek. Oh, I didn't define my back handler. 
So what happened is that um, Jetpack Compose, by default, when you hit back, it just exits the application. So I need to define a little back handler, which I will put in here, kind of like that. And you can nest these back handlers. So if you want to change the behavior of the back button, you can nest those inside other uh, composable fault calls. But here all I'm going to do is go back over to the view model and call pop. So now when we run it, I bet that'll work right. go and so let's go to the ratings now the database should still exist from the previous run when I created it so I go to the rating screen I see that if I hit back I'm gonna go to the movie screen I see the movies transporter transporter 2 Hobbs and Shaw and Jumanji welcome to the jungle actors I'm gonna see all the actors in my database so far so good so the next step is going to be setting it up so I can click on these and actually navigate my way through my database uh, so I'm going to need to deal with the linkages between things. But for right now, we're actually be able to, to visualize what's in our database pretty well. So let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. And let's say uh, 735 will start back up again. Okay, let's see. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Can you hear me okay? video up. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, onward. So what we want to do next is start dealing with relations. Uh, right now we're just looking at individual tables. We'd like to actually be able to jump between different things. So to start with what I'd like to do is from the ratings be able to click on a rating and then get a list of movies. So let's take a look at what we might need to be able to do that. Um, let's go to our DAO. And right now, these are getting all of the data. So we're getting all of the, the ratings, all of the movies, all the actors. I want to restrict that down to just the movies for a given rating. So let's take a look at what we might need to do with this. We can start off here with a query. And I'm just going to leave that blank for the moment. And we'll make it abstract fun. And let's see what we're going to actually do here. So we'll say get rating, uh, get movies for rating. So we could do this a couple ways. We could set this up so we just pass in the rating ID as a string and then return a list of movies, kind of like that. And the query for this might look like select star from movie where rating ID equals colon rating ID. So this syntax gives us the opportunity to pass in a parameter to this function in the DAO, and then that parameter gets replaced where this colon something appears. Um, and it, it takes care of escaping it as, as needed, so we don't have little bobby tables bothering us here. Uh, so this is a real simple way to get a list of movies. Now what I'd really like to do instead is have an object that contains the rating and the list of movies. So that when I make this call, I have that available and I can just use that for all the data on the page. I can display the rating information at the top and I can display the list of movies underneath it. And that'd be pretty nice there. So what I'd like to do is create a new type of object to represent that combination. And it's not going to be an entity because it's not actually a table. We're going to define a plain old Kotlin object, otherwise known as a POCO, which is similar to a plain old Java object or a POJO. 
And this will keep track of that combination of things for us. And we're going to use a special relation tag in there to be able to fetch the extra data. So if we take a look at our rating section here, I'm going to create a new class under here. And I'm going to call him rating with movies. And again, he's not a, uh, he's not an entity but he's going to have some fields inside of him that represent some, some data. So I'm going to start off by saying at embedded val rating colon rating. So we're actually going to embed a full copy of that rating object that uh, we defined there. So inside of here, we can ask the rating for its, I guess its name is really the only thing there. Oh, the rating of the description. So the name and the description we can get from there. Um, then what we want to do is have a list of movies inside of here. But we need to describe how to fetch that list of movies. So I'm going to use an at sign relation annotation here. And I'm going to say how this rating is related to the list of movies. And we do that by first of all saying the parent column is ID. So we're going to say the ID of the rating is going to be the rating ID inside all the movies. So we do that by saying child column is rating ID. Oh, sorry, not child column, entity column is rating ID. So we're going to map the ID of the rating to the rating IDs inside the movie. And this is for a one, two, many relationship rating to movies. And the only other thing we have to do is say which type of class this guy is. So we need to actually have inside here entity equals movie colon colon class just so that he knows what kind of uh, uh, entity we're dealing with when it generates code. So now this object we can use as a return type in the DAO, and it'll automatically fill the details in for us. So we go back to the DAO. I can now change this, and I'll say get rating with movies. And let me just, did I pass in? I guess I just passed in the ID of the rating. And I'm going to return a rating with movies instance. And then I'm just going to say select star from rating where ID is colon ID. Boom. Now what's going to happen behind the scenes here, whenever you have one of those at relations, it's going to run one or more extra queries. In this case, it's just going to have to run one extra query to get the data for those guys. Um, because of that, we want to make sure that these uh, all run inside the same transaction. So I'm going to come up here and say at transaction, and that'll cover the fetch of the rating and then the fetch of the movies. Otherwise, if you have some concurrent thing going on, adding stuff to the database, you might have a situation where it fetches the rating uh, and then fetches the list of, of movie IDs, tries to fetch the movies, and it really can't. Uh, get the get the proper data because something got in between. By marking it as a transaction, somebody can't update the database while we're doing this fetch. So pretty simple little call here. The relation on here is not too tricky, but this is a pretty simple one to, to many setup here. So now we're going to go over to the repository and define what he's going to look like. So I actually defined a little function here called expand. And this takes a rating object and returns a rating with movies so that when we click on something in the UE, we're going to have that rating object. We're going to create a expanded version that actually contains that rating and the, uh, the movie list inside of it. So now our details for that. Let's go to our repository here. It's going to create him. 
takes a rating, returns a rating with movies. And so this guy is going to be a suspend function that runs on an IO dispatcher. So we're going to be doing blocking IO. And then he just calls that get rating with movies. That's going to be the value returned from expand. Now we get to look at the view model. And in the view model, I'm going to define a little function called select. So we're going to select a rating, you know, whatever the, the rating is the user clicks on. We're going to go off to our repository. And then we're going to set that as a rating that the user interface can get to. So let's define this rating. Come up to the top here. Boom. So this property rating is going to be a mutable state bucket, kind of like we had for string. And it's going to be either a rating with movies instance or null. So it's valid, he's possible to be null. We're going to start him off as null. We're going to set this guy up to have a private setter, which means nobody from the outside can set this field. But on the outside, they can actually fetch it. So they can take a look at rating and do something with it. So if we go back to our main activity now, and let's take a look at rating screen. I'm going to uncomment that because we now have this select function that we just defined. So when you click on something, it can select it and then switch you over to the rating screen. And then the rating screen we'll define here. Let me just find him real quick here and copy him over. This is a single rating screen, so it's just a single item. I'm going to copy him. There he is. And so what this screen does is he takes a rating with movies to display, and he has a function to say, somebody clicked on a movie. Let me go ahead and navigate there. So he's going to be a column of just a title at the top, which is, let's go to that rating with movies, try to get a rating, try to get a name. Now the syntax here in Kotlin, we're using the safe null accessor, uh, safe accessor operator. So if rating with movies is null, we're going to skip the rest of this expression. Otherwise, we're going to try to get the rating. And if the rating is null, we're going to skip the rest of that expression. So we'll try to get the name. But if rating with movies is non-null and rating is non-null and name is non-null, that's going to be our value. If this expression comes back as null for any of those reasons. Mr. Elvis here is going to say use this value instead of the null. Now we call this Elvis because if you turn your head 90 degrees to the left, it kind of looks like Elvis with his little cur curly hair type thing going on there. Um, and it's not just a Kotlin operator, that's been in other languages as well. But this syntax here is incredibly concise compared to what you'd have to do in Java. You'd have to have all sorts of nested ifs and a bunch of else's there just to try to make this thing work. It'd be really gross. Um, but in Kotlin, if it's not null, keep going. If it's not null, keep going. Otherwise, and then, you know, if it's not null at the end, that's the value. If it is null, just use a blank. Then we're going to walk through all the movies. Again, null check here. If these guys here are null, it's going to completely skip that for each. It's just not going to process it. Um, if it's non null, we're going to display the list of the titles of the movies and then call that select when they're clicked. So now if we come back up here, selecting that movie is going to go and select it in the view model. I'm going to go ahead and comment him out for the moment because we haven't set up support for him yet. But what we should see here now is if we click on a rating, we should see it appear. I uh, believe we're in good shape there. Let's try running it. Uh, during the break, I cleaned the cache on Android Studio. And you can do that by going File, Invalidate Caches. And from there, choose Invalidate and Restart. 
um, that will clear the IntelliJ cache. Um, doesn't seem to have been done much for the build speed here. I'm really surprised this build is running so slowly. I'm going to find out at some point that I went into low performance mode on my laptop somehow. And it's a gaming laptop. It, it's, a, it's a screamer. It shouldn't be taking this long. Oh, you know what I think? I bet it's my um, my virus scanner. Let me actually try really quickly here, because I I re uh, set up my laptop and I don't think I put my exclusions back in yet. Let me do that real quick here. Um, oh, it opened up over here. Um, so virus and threat protection. Um, manage settings. Exclusions. Yeah, I didn't have any exclusions. I think that's the problem here. Let me try that. So I'll add in a folder. D Android class. I'll also do that one. And hopefully that will actually speed things up. Okay, let's take a look at our ratings. Boom. I'm going to go ahead and click on PG-13. And here are the PG-13 movies. Transporter, Hobbs and Shaw, and Jumanji. Transporter 2 was rated R, so it didn't show up on here. So now we'll come up here and let's click on R, and we'll see Transporter 2. If we go to not rated, there's nothing that's not rated. If we go to G, nothing that's G. There we go. So we have a, a nice setup here for uh, making this actually work. So I can mute this other laptop. There we go. Any questions so far? So that was a pretty easy relationship between those two guys. Um, let's try something a little bit more complex. We're going to, for the movies, let's try to show the actors and vice versa. So in order to do that, let's go to the movie here. And I'm going to define a data class movie with roles. And then inside there, we'll have an embedded val movie movie. So we're just going to go ahead and grab whatever the current movie is there. We're going to have a little bit more complex relation here. Where what we'd like to do is say val roles is a list of role. I'll just use role for now. We're going to eventually put that extra data in there for role details. But right now I'm just going to, oh, actually I'm, I'm going to say the actors. Yeah. So we'd like to just get the list of actors for a movie. Now we're not going to have the uh, the role they played in the movie in here. It's just going to link the movie to the actors. But because this is a many-to-many -many relationship, we're going through an extra table here. So inside of here, I've got a parent column situation and a entity column situation. And I've got to match something in here to something in here. But there's a middleman involved. The something in here is going to be ID. And the something down in the actor is also going to be ID. But we're not linking those together. We're not saying, give me actors that have the same ID as the movie. We need to go through a separate, in, a separate class here. And we'll do that by saying associate by, passing in a junction object here. And the thing we're going through is a role. That role instance has a movie ID and has actor IDs. So we're going to link the parent column here to a parent column inside here. So the parent column for movie, that ID, is going to be the movie ID inside the role. The entity column, that's going to be for the actor, is going to map to the actor ID inside there. So now that we have that, 
we should be able to set up some some code to actually really get him. So let me copy him over to the DAO. So here we're going to try to select from the movie where the ID coming in is the movie ID. And we're going to get back a movie with roles object. So behind the scenes, it's going to use that at relation to run another queries to get the, the actual uh, actors. So at this point, we should be able to display actors for a movie. So I'm going to go to our main activity. We'll come down to our... Did I have movie screen in there? Oh, I didn't have movie screen in there yet. Let me copy them over. Paste him in. And we're going to have movie with roles. And this is going to be a little bit different, so I'm going to comment him out. All we have is the um, actor names to display inside here. So we can just list the actor names because we just have an actor coming in. And then if you select it, we should go to that actor to see which movies he's inside of. Um, so I believe, is that it? I think actually we need to, so I put in the thing with the DAO, I need the repository stuff. So go over to our movie repository. We have a couple more expands. I'll just comment him out for a moment. And then the actual ones in the movie database repository, the concrete instance. And then I'll comment him out. That should give us the uh, traversal through there. And then finally for the view model, you can do the same kind of thing up here for movie. This is going to be movie with roles. And we need a select for him as well. Movie, movie. And we'll say expand movie. Oops, what happened? Oh, I hope we had the right uh, thing there. And I think we might need a tweak in the user interface. Let's see. So we had our rating screen. We're going to call select the rating screen up here. We need to fix this so that it'll actually select the movie. And then we actually need to make the movie screen show up. We'll comment out his select for the moment. And the movie screen is down there already. I think we're in good shape. Let's try running it. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship that we're setting up here. Hopefully this build will run a lot faster now. I do I did the right directory, didn't I? Let me just double check. So D Android class. Yeah, that was much better. Um, okay, so we'll go to our ratings. From there I can pick a rating. And from there I should be able to click on the transporter. And boom, we have the transporter with the actors listed inside there. Now let's go the other direction. Let's go from the actors over. So the next thing we're going to need is in the DAO. Well, actually, uh, in Actor, we're going to need to define that guy. He's very, very similar, so I'm just going to copy him over. And he's just going to go to Movie for the moment. Same kind of thing there. In our repository, gonna uncomment that. Database repository, same kind of thing, we'll uncomment him. Oh, 
Oops, what did I do? Oh, I didn't put the... Yeah, I didn't put the DAO function in there yet. That should be good. And now let's go back and see if he's okay. He's happy. View model. Gonna do the same kind of thing up here for actor. For actor with roles. And we need to select for him. And back to our UE. Let's uncomment some more stuff here, or copy some stuff over. I guess I didn't copy it over yet. We need our actor screen. And we'll again change this to just be In this case, the movie name, or the title, there we go. And we'll select the movie to go around there. And I believe, oh, we just need to uncomment this guy. So the actor screen needs to exist. And we need to uncomment the thing that lets us select the movie. Okay, let's run him. There's probably a couple other directories I need to exclude for um, some of the cache stuff, but it's a decent bit better than it was. There he is. That wasn't too bad. And I can fix that during the next build. So we'll go to ratings and go to the movie. We can go to an actor. The actor has the movies. We can go to the movie. Ta-da. So we have some nice navigation between all of these. And I can just kind of go back out from here. The problem right now is we don't have that extra information saying which role these actors are playing. And we don't have ability to sort them based on the order they appear in the credits. So what we'd like to do is add that extra information in. And unfortunately, there isn't a good way to set it up so that when we're doing that relation to link things, so let's take a look here. When we're doing this relation that links through the role, we can't get extra information from that role class. So what I did was define that role with an extra column in it, this role details ID, so that instead of joining from movie to actor, I can join from movie to role details, and I can join from actor to role details. And by doing that, the role details has the movie, the actor, the role name, and the order in the um, uh, the order in the credits. So if we take a look <coughs> at this guy, I'm going to define role details. Let's go to role. And role details has an ID for the role details instance. We can link to that. That's going to be this guy. And then the actor and movie ID, the character, the order, and the credits. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and fetch the movie and fetch the actor. Now, depending on what you're doing, you may want to break this into two objects so you're not fetching both the movie and the actor every single time. Uh, it's useless going one direction because you've already got it. You, know, you have the movie when you're looking at the roles, or you have the actor when you're moving the roles. Um, but to keep things simple, I'm just keeping it like this. So we take all this. He matches up to the role up here. And we're in pretty good shape there. What was this? Oh, role details is another entity. There we go. So this is going to be a new entity that I'm adding in. 
he's going to have a foreign key back to the role so that if this role gets deleted, we'll automatically delete the role details object. Let's add him to the database before I forget. Otherwise, it won't generate a table for him and, it, and he wouldn't be available in the DAO. And so now we can actually clean things up a little bit here. Let's go back to the DAO. And actually in here, we don't have to change anything because we're just returning these objects. It's the behind the scenes that it actually does some stuff there. Uh, for the repository, we don't change anything. Yeah. And for the view model, I don't think we're changing anything. I think we just have to change the UE at this point. So down in here, where I commented these guys out, Oh, I had to change these as well. So this, instead of this being an actor, this has to be a uh, role details. And we're going to link that up. So we're going to use the ID in the role details is going to be the role details ID. So we're going to link through that role class, mapping the role details ID to role details. So we have the extra information rather than just going directly to the actor. And then the role details will fetch the extra information based on his relation. So we got him and we need to fix the actor to do the same thing. There we go. And now I think we go back to the user interface. He's not going to be as happy. Yep. Okay. So in the movie screen, he's now unhappy with that because we no longer are directly talking to a person. We're talking to that role detail. So I'm going to undo him. And now we can ask the role details object for the character name and then the actor's name for that. Um, and we could also in this where we're doing this for each, before we do the for each, we could do a whoops. question mark dot sorted by it dot um, order and credits. There we go. And then that way we make sure that they're they're coming up in the right order based on how the, the movie defined the credits. And so we'll do the same kind of thing for our actor screen. And I can put in that sorted by as well. And let's try that out and see how it works. So this is giving us a many-to-many -many relationship with extra data for um, uh, the association. It's not quite as clean as some ORMs might do this because we had to actually do an extra step in there. Um, but it should work pretty nicely. And while I'm waiting on this, I'm going to see if I can... Well, he's done already. It's going to add another exclusion into here for my directory the Android and Gradle stuff which should speed things up a little bit I think that's all I'm going to put in there for right now okay um, oops, something is not right. Entities cannot have relations. Um, which one was this? That's role details. Let me just double check my role details over here again. Hmm. That's weird because I did that before and it seemed to work. It 
So he's a new entity. And then in here, movie with roles is going to reference him. That looks good. Huh, interesting. I just copy that as is. Oh, um, one thing that, that happened here, um, I bet the problem is because I already had a database created. Well, no, this is this is dying at build time, isn't it? It's not dying when it's running. If it were dying when it's running, I'd say that's because I already have a database to find, and then I have a schema conflict. But let me try running this one more time. So this little error is, is this little warning is telling me that the role details ID is being used to join, but it's not covered by an index, so it's actually going to be slow. Um, and that's a good point. We should add him in there. Um, so up in here, we add an index on role details ID, and then what do we have here? So. Role details has a foreign key that references role, but role does not have a unique index on those columns. Um, so wait a second. So he's line 33 of role. Is a foreign key that references role. Unique constraint and reference parent columns. Huh. So I didn't actually put this guy in here. Um, I set this guy up to delete. If the role gets deleted, we delete the role details. Um. Because the primary key on this is really just the movie ID and the actor ID, and this is just an extra guy who's referenced over here. And he has a primary key on him. I love it when an example I do before class works, and then I get in class and the same code is not working. At least it looks like the same code is not working. Um, Hmm, interesting. Let me, while I'm thinking of it though, come down here and uncomment this guy. I did not define the inserts for him yet, so in the DAO, we'll add him in. So this is going to be role details. We'll do an insert on him as well. Okay. That'll make him a little happier. And in the role details, we had ID, movie ID, actor ID, character, order and credits. What's he complaining about here? Whoops. No value passed for actor or movie. So something is funky with that. Oh, I think I think it's because I just added these guys in and I ran out of time before class. That's probably what it was. So let me just delete those for the moment. Um, I don't think we're going to need those.
Huh. Um, but actually I did want to get those. So he has to be an entity. I'm going to have to think this particular one through a little bit more and see if I can get that to work. Um, there's going to be a way to do it, but um, it maybe a little more involved than I thought it was going to be. So I'll have to take a look at that. So for right now, let's see what the user interface is going to do with this. Yeah, because I can't go through the actor at this point. Um, hmm, I thought I had that working, but apparently not. So I'm going to back out a few changes here on this side. Because we're not going to be able to do him. This one is going to be just it.name for the actor, or for the or title in this case, because it's for the movie. And the actor with roles is not going to have a role detail. It's going to have just a role. And actually, no, that's, that's uh, the movie. This is a movie ID. So I'm just going to revert this just so we have an example that's uh, doing it. You're not going to be doing um, many to many relationships like this anyway uh, in the example, in the assignment. So that's him. That was the actor. Let's go to the movie and fix him back up again here. Actor ID, actor. And back into here. That's good now. I'm just going to go ahead and delete those. Now I'll keep them there because I can hopefully fix this. And then this will be it.name. Because we're just going to print the actor's name. And we'll select the actor. And let's just make sure that's going to work again. There may be somewhere along the line that I, I missed a uh, something to revert, but let me take a look. Yeah, that was a little bit better. Um, so role details is a foreign key. I just need to comment out role details for the moment. And remove them from the database definition. And we'll try that again. Movie DAO references a type that's not present. Ah. And we'll try that again. There we go. Oops, somebody's not happy. It's going to be a database schema mismatch, I bet. There we go. Room cannot verify the data integrity. Looks like you've changed the schema, but forgot to update the version number. So when you're developing, one thing you can do is just delete or uninstall the application and reinstall it. Um, or what you can do is go back to the database definition and up the version number if the schema has changed. So in this case, the schema had changed somewhat. So we can up the version number. That should be OK, but then that's going to trigger auto migration. So if you're really not talking migration, which is usually if you've released a version and you want to uh, uh, release a new version where the data database is different, 
that's when you really want to work on migration. When you're working toward version one like this, usually your best bet is just go ahead and, and uninstall the app and reinstall it. Um, otherwise, you're going to keep updating this version constantly and put in migration rules that you don't need because nobody's got the database. You don't need to migrate. So I'm going to come in here and uninstall him. And then when I rerun it, it should be just fine. Okay, so let's look at the ratings. Oh, because I reinstalled it, there's no data in the database yet. So I have to hit that reset database. And then boom, there's some ratings. Can go in, Hobbs and Shaw, I see The Rock and Jason Statham. Let's go to Jason Statham, we see that. See Hobbs and Shaw, The Rock, Jumanji. There we go. So we can navigate around through this. And then if we keep going back long enough, eventually we get back out of the application here. And we can start with movies as well, or start with actors. So this gives you some basic ideas of what you can do with it. For your assignment, you're going to have to do a one-to-many relationship. You're going to have contacts that have addresses. And we're going to assume for this assignment that an address can only belong to one person. You don't have multiple people leaving an address. Not super realistic, but it's a little less work. You don't have to worry about... Um, um, uh, many-to-many -many relationships. Um, I'm going to tinker around and see if I can get the many-to-many uh, -to, -many to work like I wanted it to. I thought I had that working, but um, it sounds like I was halfway through the edit there and uh, didn't have time to finish it before the class. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, so I will, uh, a little bit later tonight, I will post the video and the code for this class. Um, I will also post the new assignment definition. Um, don't use the assignment description that's on the course web or on the course website, um, because it's going to be a little bit out of date. Um, I want you to try to follow what I've been doing in here, because I've, I've updated the way I'm doing the relations and things a little bit more than last time. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, preferably via the, uh, the forums. And uh, other than that, I will see you next week. Good night.